Hello, my name is Benjamin Greenberg. I'm a professor of neurology at the University of Texas Southwestern, and I direct the neuroimmunology program at UT Southwestern. I'm delighted to be here today talking about emerging therapies across the disease spectrum. Even though the CMSC meeting is happening virtually, I hope this content will be helpful, educational, and thought-provoking, and I look forward to interacting with all of you in person next year. First, there are a few housekeeping items that we need to go through as part of today's presentation. Uh, this presentation is accredited for uh, continuing education credit and in support of improving patient care, the CMSC is jointly accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education, the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, and the American Nurses Credentialing Center to provide continuing education for the healthcare team. The presentation offers one hour of continuing education for physicians, nurses, pharmacists, PAs, psychologists, and social workers. So welcome to you all, and I hope you enjoyed today's talk. Importantly, as required for all CME events, our disclosure of financial relationships. And for today's talk, I wanna to call careful attention to both consulting and grant support that I have received that is relevant to today's topic. I've been involved with companies across the spectrum doing multiple sclerosis research, and some of their products will be discussed today. My comments will be limited to information that is publicly available uh, in peer-reviewed published literature or in review literatures, and uh, will present data based on what is in the public sphere. So with that out of the way, let's move on to the learning objectives for today. There are several high-level learning objectives that we want to go through when talking about emerging therapies for MS across the spectrum of the disease. And it's important to note that while the CMSC was making the transition from an in-person meeting to a virtual meeting, this title for the talk was sent to me and I uh, happily accepted uh, taking on this role, but it has a lot of intricate issues involved when talking about the spectrum of disease and therapeutics. While we're gonna talk about new and late stage therapeutics for relapsed and remitting MS, progressive MS, we are also gonna talk about the notions of neuroprotection and remyelination, symptomatic therapy, as well as alternative or complementary therapies. What has traditionally been defined as different stages of the disease or different therapeutic approaches has become blurred in the last several years. No longer are there clear demarcated lines between neuroprotective therapies and therapies that impact relapsed and remitting disease or progressive disease. In fact, there have been investigations looking at symptomatic therapies and whether or not it changes the course of the disease over time. So these artificial divisions that we've used for many years may not hold true for the next 10 to 20 years. And some therapies that we classify as treating progressive may indeed treat more than just progressive disease. When thinking about the title for this talk, the notion of a spectrum of disease really gave me pause. Because when we talk about the spectrum of disease, the classic definition talks about the different populations that we serve. And the way I was brought up within the MS world was to think about relapsing, remitting, secondary progressive and primary progressive disease. In recent years with FDA approvals of new medications, labeling has changed to draw attention to the difference between active secondary progressive disease versus chronic secondary progressive disease. This notion that we could have patients who phenotypically seem to be slowly progressing over time, thereby meeting the definition of secondary progressive disease, but having superimposed relapses or superimposed new gadolinium enhancing lesions on MRI has raised questions about these artificial definitions on when a patient transitions from what we've called relapsing remitting to the progressive state of the disease. And so when we talk about the spectrum, this is the classic spectrum we discuss, and it has implications for labeling for new drugs that the FDA is considering. And it also has implications, profound implications, for trial designs. Which patient cohort would you enroll in a trial for a new drug? And how would you set up an inclusion exclusion criteria to ensure that you get a homogenous population? For anyone who's done clinical trials, they can tell you it is difficult to draw a dividing line between relapse or emitting MS with some symptomatic progression versus active secondary progressive MS. 
it can be difficult and it makes these artificial barriers very um, uh, difficult to enforce in a unified way. But when thinking about that word spectrum, uh, it's important to note that the spectrum of the disease doesn't just have to do with populations and different diagnostic categories, but it also has to do with biology. We have thought about relapsing remitting disease, which is the most common form of multiple sclerosis, as the immune-mediated attack within the central nervous system, mostly leading to asymptomatic changes, but often leading to clinical relapses with resulting disability. And we've thought about progressive disease as a completely separate entity because phenotypically we don't see the relapses and we don't see the attacks in the same way as relapsing remitting MS, but every year patients continue to decline symptomatically. Biologically, however, the spectrum discussion is very different because it has become clear that while the adaptive immune system plays a critical role in causing the relapses that we see in relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, there is a component of the, both the adaptive and the innate immune system that plays a role in the slow progression that we see over time in progressive patients, whether it be secondary or primary progressive MS. And the real question is, when does that biology begin? Does the biology of progressive MS start even before the first relapse? And if that is true, wouldn't therapies that target progressive disease as a phenotype have a role for our patients biologically who have been classified as relapsing or remitting multiple sclerosis. And so the spectrum of biology blurs the lines between our patient populations and blurs the lines relative to therapeutic decisions we're gonna make about which drugs might be useful for which patient populations. And then finally, when thinking about this term spectrum, it's important to talk about the spectrum of therapies. And there have been a variety of different categories that I referenced earlier immunomodulation categories, symptom management categories, drugs that are meant to remyelinate the nervous system and neuroprotective agents. It is not exactly clear when looking at an individual drug how it should be categorized. For example, a profound immunomodulator that prevents attacks on the nervous system in some definitions could be considered neuroprotective. But in the general use of the term, neuroprotection means a intervention that despite an immune system attack would lead to preservation of the nervous system. And so there are terms that we can use to separate these drugs, but how they get applied in the real world is starting to break down. But let's take these different spectrums, the spectrum of a population, the spectrum of the biology and the spectrum of the therapies and talk about what's coming out in the world of multiple sclerosis. And to start, we're gonna talk about the relapse remitting multiple sclerosis therapeutic landscape. As everybody here is well aware, the landscape has changed dramatically uh, over the last 20 years. And when we look since the first FDA approval of a disease modifying therapy in 1993, interferon beta 1b, we have come a long way, adding first the injectable therapies going through the 2000s, then with the addition of natalizumab, uh, which was brought onto the market, removed from the market for safety reasons and then brought back under a risk mitigation strategy. And then came the era of oral therapies, fungolamide, terraflutamide, dimethyl fumarate, that added not only a different uh, mechanism of action, but a different route of administration and a different level of success for treating multiple sclerosis patients. In recent times, the explosion of drugs has continued to give us a, a diverse armamentarium for treating MS patients. We had different versions of glutarimer acetate and interferon come out, alemtuzumab, diclizumab, which was released and then removed for safety purposes, ocrelizumab, and then most recently, cladribine and saponamide. This incredibly diverse uh, group of medications has given us unparalleled success at putting the vast majority of our patients into remission for relapsing or remitting MS but there are a variety of needs that still exist that is driving uh, ongoing research and development in therapeutics. Here's just a short list. We're gonna expand it significantly of different drugs that have either completed their phase three trials, ofatumumab, ozonamod, and uh, panisamod, which we'll talk about. Biotin, which unfortunately failed to meet its endpoint in registrational trials. 
and then drugs that are currently undergoing phase three trials. This partial list gives us a sense of the changing landscape that we're gonna face over the next few years and beyond. But if we focus on the drugs that are currently available relative to FDA approval in the United States for multiple sclerosis, we can categorize them based on safety and efficacy. And when we rearrange this and we look at the different agents separated by how safe they are and relative efficacy at a population level, these are the general distributions of the drugs. Now, I know there are gonna be some people in the audience who say I need to move one drug a little to the left or the right, or one drug a little higher or lower relative to safety, and your criticisms are well-founded. This is an inexact representation of where these drugs fit. This is not done to scale, but is to give a sense that in general, as the risk of a drug goes up, uh, or it becomes, I should say, less safe, the efficacy improves. The bigger the hit to the immune system seems to be tied with a bigger rate of success for preventing new relapses. Now, when you look at these drugs relative to safety and efficacy, there is a distribution across these axes. But if you superimpose mechanism of action and you separate the drugs between pure immunomodulating drugs to immunosuppressive drugs, to immune remodeling drugs, there seems to be a trend that the more immune remodeling we do, the greater the success we get. Now, this again is not a clear distinction. I don't consider natalizumab to be an immune remodeler, even though it's over to the right in terms of efficacy. But there's a general trend relative to an association between immune remodeling and a better outcome. So how does this impact the emerging therapies? So in the setting of relapse remitting multiple sclerosis, there are a variety of drugs that have either completed their phase three trials or are about to complete their phase three trials. We do not have time today to cover every possible agent, but I wanted to highlight a few categories of emerging therapies based on mechanism of action, both old and new, so you'll be prepared for the discussions that are about to occur within the world of relapse remitting multiple sclerosis. Now in the setting of anti-CD20 therapies, the currently FDA-approved therapy is ocrelizumab, which was a next generation, a humanized version of rituximab, which had been used off-label in the past in MS, had undergone phase two clinical trials, and then transitioned to phase two and phase three trials of ocrelizumab, ultimately getting FDA approval for relapse-remitting MS and primary progressive MS. But there are other anti-CD20 molecules which are going to become available in the United States if the FDA grants approval for multiple sclerosis. So it's important to note for these two drugs, ofatumumab and ublituximab, uh, they have not yet been FDA approved, uh, but are either under consideration or completing trials. And let's look at each one individually. So first, ofatumumab is a fully humanized anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody and the unique aspect about this drug is that it's delivery route. Instead of being infused, this is a subcutaneous injection. So if you recall, ocrelizumab, which is an infusion once every six months, ofatumumab is an injection once a month. And it went uh, through studies, including the MIRROR study, which was a phase two placebo control trial, which did meet its primary endpoint of reduction of new gadolinium enhancing lesions. And it went through two randomized active comparator phase three trials where ofatumumab was compared to teraflutamide in the 14 milligram a day dose. These trials enrolled over 1800 relapse remitting patients and met its primary endpoints of a reduction of annualized relapse rates compared to the active comparator teraflutamide. It is currently being reviewed uh, relative to FDA approval. And if it gets FDA approval, will be an interesting alternative relative to infusible anti-CD20 therapies uh, for our patients. The next anti-CD20 molecule to be aware of is ublituximab. So this is an interesting glycoengineered anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. And what's the difference between this and ocrelizumab? Due to its engineering, the, what the studies uh, have uh, examined is whether or not we could infuse the drug faster than rituximab or ocrelizumab and avoid infusion reactions. 
So in general, ocrelizumab is infused over six to eight hours on average. And in clinical trials, ublituximab has been infused as fast as one hour infusion times. It has completed a phase two placebo controlled trial as listed here and is currently uh, in two phase three trials randomized to active comparator, again, teraflutamide. We do not yet have the results of the ultimate one or ultimate two clinical trials, but once they are available, if the drug is found to be safe and effective, uh, it'll be under consideration by the FDA. And so if uh, all of these drugs get approved, we will live in a world where we have multiple different versions of infusible anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies, as well as a monoclonal antibody that can be given by the patient via subcutaneous injection. And while patients have a diversity of preferences relative to routes of administration, we'll have multiple tools in our toolbox to offer anti-CD20 therapies. So let's go back to the list of emerging therapies for relapse remitting multiple sclerosis. We spoke about the anti-CD20 drugs. Let's move on to S1P modulation. And we're gonna talk about two uh, new drugs uh, in the field of relapse remitting multiple sclerosis, ozonamide and panisamide. In order to set the stage for this, I first wanna remind everybody about S1P receptor and modulations. The current FDA approved therapy, fingolimod, and siponamod are both uh, S1P receptor modulators. Fingolimod is a prodrug. It undergoes uh, uh, phosphorylation and becomes the active drug that binds four out of five of the S1P receptors. When you look at siponamod, uh, ozonamod, and ponisamod, they're listed here on the slide as to which of the S1P receptors they bind. And each of these drugs have different binding characteristics, both in terms of half-life and in terms of which receptors they bind, leading to different biologies uh, for each of the drugs. But as a class, each of these are considered S1P receptor modulators. So let's look at the two new ones uh, that should be considered beyond fingolimod and siponamod. So the first is ozonamod, which has received FDA approval based on two phase three clinical trials. The first one that we'll review was the Sunbeam trial, which looked at two different doses of ozonamod compared to interferon. The trial met its primary endpoint of a statistically significant reduction in uh, the adjusted annualized relapse rate. It also met its secondary endpoints, which were based on MRI measures. Furthermore, in the RADIANCE trial, which was again a phase three randomized comparator trial between ozonamod at two different doses and interferon, the trial was able to meet its primary endpoint of annualized relapse reduction, as well as the variety of secondary endpoints, including MRI measures um, uh, and uh, a variety of MRI measures that looked at gray matter volume and whole brain volume. So this drug has been FDA approved and it uh, will be available in the clinic for prescribing to your patients. Panesimod uh, is not yet uh, FDA approved, uh, but will be under consideration. It finished phase two trials which looked, which looked at three different doses compared to placebo. It was able to meet its primary endpoint, which was a reduction in cumulative new gadolinium enhancing lesions. In addition, at the high dose of 40 milligrams of penicillin versus placebo, there was a reduction of annualized relapse rates by 52%. A phase three trial, the optimum trial, found that penicillin at 20 milligrams versus an active comparator, teraflutamide, at 14 milligrams a day, was able to achieve its primary endpoint of reducing the annualized relapse rate. Thus, this drug is in position to be considered by the FDA there are other trials going on with this drug of interest, which look at combination therapy between penicillin and dimethyl fumarate, which is currently FDA approved. And so the use of this drug is being looked at in a variety of ways beyond just monotherapy. It is not yet available for prescribing. So going back to our list of emerging therapies relative to relapse remitting multiple sclerosis, it's important to note that anti-CD20 uh, therapy is something that we become familiar with 
through prior use of rituximab and current FDA approved use of ocrelizumab. S1P modulation, again, is something we as practitioners have become familiar with over the last decade with the use of fingolimod and more recently the introduction of saponimod for active secondary progressive MS uh, as well as the spectrum of MS patients. But now in the world of emerging therapies for MS, there are new drugs with different mechanisms of action that we will need to become aware of as we expand our arsenal. So the first biology I wanna talk about is relative to the Bruton's tyrosine kinase and specifically a class of drugs called Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors. There are multiple drugs moving from phase two to phase three trials. And this is a biology we, as multiple sclerosis practitioners, will have to become aware of and proficient in. So let's first talk about what Bruton's tyrosine kinase is and what it does. In general, the biology of BTK, Bruton's tyrosine kinase, revolves around B cell activation. Once a B cell receptor is activated, uh, the B cell can mature and become an antigen presenting cell, secreting um, uh, cytokines and proliferating to support an immune response. Furthermore, autoantibodies can be produced by activated plasma cells. Within myeloid cells, including microglia, activation of an FC receptor leads to Bruton's tyrosine kinase causing the cell to release cytokines, inflammatory mediators that lead to organ damage. So BTK is an attractive target of therapy for two different reasons. Theoretically, uh, inhibiting this enzyme would inhibit B cell activation in the setting of multiple sclerosis, leading to a reduction of autoantibodies or a reduction of antigen presentation to T cells for auto uh, antigens. And furthermore, within microglia, a portion of the innate immune system within the central nervous system that is thought to play a role in progressive disease, inhibition of the tyrosine kinase may lead to a reduction in inflammation and a reduction of damage to neurons and oligodendrocytes. So what do we know about the agents that are being studied? So the first of many uh, is evabrutinib. So this drug uh, completed a phase two randomized placebo-controlled and active comparator-controlled trial, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year. In this trial, three different doses of evabrutinib was compared to placebo and an arm taking dimethyl fumarate. And in the end, uh, the patients were studied both in terms of MRI outcomes and relative to clinical outcomes, specifically relapses. The drug was able to meet its primary endpoint in terms of reducing uh, the uh, lesion rate ratio and looking relative to placebo of a superior efficacy as measured by MRI. And based on this data, evabrutinib is moving towards a phase three trial. A second BTK inhibitor, which currently has its uh, developed name of SAR and then the long numbers that follow after it, completed its phase two trial repeating, uh, excuse me, reportedly meeting its MRI endpoints. This is unpublished data. This is via news releases and uh, with the expectation that data would be discussed at the American Academy of Neurology and CMSC uh, and Ectrums Ectrums and thanks to COVID, uh, we are finding other ways to learn about the ending of trials, so we are awaiting publication of this data. But there are multiple phase three trials planned uh, with this agent uh, that are listed in clinicaltrials.gov, including both relapse and remitting patient populations as well as progressive MS populations. So become familiar with Bruton's tyrosine kinase and its inhibition because we will be uh, working with these agents uh, if they are safe and effective for years to come. So going back to our list of emerging therapies for relapsing and remitting multiple sclerosis, uh, I wanna move on to another agent with a completely different mechanism of action. Again, a biology that many of us in the field may not be familiar with, but need to become familiar with if indeed this drug is able to meet its primary endpoints in trial. And this drug uh, is called uh, elazinumab, uh, and it targets a biology 
around the RGMA protein. RGMA stands for Repulsive Guidance Mo uh, Molecule Member A. So this is an interesting protein on the surface of neurons uh, that inhibits neurite growth after damage within the central nervous system. So normally it's there to guide how axons uh, grow. Uh, it's there to help with cell uh, development, differentiation, and survival. But in a damaged nervous system, it is uh, inhibitory of repair. In addition, uh, the RGMA protein is found in immune cells, and it regulates inflammation and neurodegeneration in the animal model of multiple sclerosis, EAE. So via two different possible biologies inhibiting this protein via a monoclonal antibody, uh, which used to be referred to as ABT-155, but is now known as elazinumab. Uh, this becomes an attractive therapeutic target and is an example of a blurred therapeutic spectrum where the drug may be beneficial both from a neuro-repair perspective as well as an immune modulation perspective. There are currently two phase two clinical trials going on and these include a trial in relapsed remitting multiple sclerosis, as well as a trial within progressive MS. So again, an example where one therapy is being used in different spectrums of the disease, uh, potentially based on its different mechanisms of action. Finally, we get to the topic of emerging therapies in relapsed remitting MS around bone marrow transplant. So this has been a protocol that's been around in one form or another for many years. And we constantly get questions in our clinic about the usefulness of being uh, treated with a bone marrow transplant and what's involved in a bone marrow transplant relative to multiple sclerosis. And it's important to note that when we talk about the different mechanism of, of action of therapies from immunomodulation to immunosuppression to immune remodeling, uh, I consider the bone marrow transplant to be the ultimate of immune remodulation, where we are wiping out an old immune system and growing a brand new one. I thought it'd be useful to give a little background about what are the different aspects of a bone marrow transplant. And these are referred to as an autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And it's important to understand the vocabulary that our oncologists use because now as neurologists and neuroimmunologists, we will be using the same vocabulary. A protocol for a hematopoietic stem cell transplant involves mobilization, where we literally mobilize the patient's own stem cells. We get them to leave the bone marrow and move into the bloodstream so we can move on to harvesting those stem cells and preserving them. So we induce the cells to leave the bone marrow uh, usually through apheresis, we pull out those stem cells and then we bank them because what we're about to do the patient through conditioning is ablate that patient's peripheral uh, immune system as well as their bone marrow. So they enter the aplastic phase where they literally do not have an ability to make red blood cells or uh, an immune system. And this is where we take those cryopreserved harvested stem cells that the patient donated themselves after mobilization and give it back to the individual. And then they enter a recovery phase. As you can imagine, there are significant risks to uh, mobilizing, conditioning, the aplastic phase and during recovery. And most of these risks uh, relate to the risk of infection uh, while a person doesn't have an immune system. Thankfully, due to advances in the care of patients undergoing an autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplants, multiple trials have shown a safety record in the setting of multiple sclerosis. And I'll highlight um, from one publication, a table that compared, that looked at two uh, randomized trials uh, using hematopoietic stem cell transplants in MS. It's important to note that there have been many more trials, uh, some observational uh, trials and prospective trials, but these two were randomized trials uh, where patients who underwent stem cell transplants were compared to individuals who got disease-modifying therapies. Uh, I can guarantee that you're unable to read any of the small print 
uh, from this table. And so I blew up uh, one portion of it uh, to give you a sense of the outcomes data. It's still small, but slightly bigger than the other slide. And on the right, it talks about one trial that had follow-up over five years. And in this trial, patients were randomized to receive a bone marrow transplant or a standard of care disease modifying therapy. And over the five years, only 5% of the individuals who underwent the stem cell transplant had disability worsening compared to two thirds of the individuals who underwent therapy with a disease modifying therapy. Now, this is not a blinded trial, it's an open label trial. There's uh, really no way to blind a bone marrow transplant. And so the best you can do is a randomized observational trial. But please note at the bottom of this table for both of these randomized trials, the overall survival in each was 100%. So despite the risks of undergoing the mobilization, the harvesting, and the aplastic phase after the conditioning regimen, uh, thankfully survival has been 100%. Making a bone marrow transplant an interesting option for patients who aren't responding to other therapies or an aggressive intervention early in the course of the disease if you think somebody is prognostically uh, in bad shape. With all this and all the studies around bone marrow transplants in the background, uh, the largest, most integrated trial of bone marrow transplants is underway. And it's referred to as the BEAT-MS protocol, so, which stands for the best available therapy versus autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So this is a randomized trial, which will follow over 150 patients for six years. And I wanna point that out because in a world of clinical trials, where we often get one or two years of follow-up after the randomization, this trial was specifically designed to give longer-term data. And interestingly, patients are not gonna be randomized to just any disease-modifying therapy, but they're gonna be randomized to the ones that have been classified as highly efficacious, natalizumab, alentuzumab, ocrelizumab, or off-label use of rituximab. And so we will get a sense of taking this very aggressive intervention of bone marrow transplant and comparing it to our most efficacious FDA-approved therapies for MS. So as you can tell, there are a lot of things changing in the world of relapse-remitting MS. Drugs that uh, utilize biology that we're well aware of, as well as drugs that utilize biology that we aren't as familiar with. And so there's gonna be a lot to keep up with relative to emerging therapies. But this explosion isn't just in the world of relapse-remitting MS. There are a lot of changes happening for progressive MS as well. So let's take a look at the current landscape of therapies for progressive MS. To date, the only drug that still has an FDA approved label for primary progressive MS is ocrelizumab. Yet with the recognition of active secondary progressive MS as a specific phenotype, there are a variety of drugs who carry labels of approval for active secondary progressive MS. This is different than this notion of chronic secondary MS where we aren't seeing relapses. What are the options for progressive MS outside of active secondary progressive MS? And I wanna turn your attention to a few drugs that are in development. We'll talk a little bit about ibutilas, a drug, uh, a therapy known as ATA-188 and simvastatin. So currently, ibutilast is undergoing further studies after successful completion of a phase two randomized placebo-controlled trial in progressive MS. And what was important in this trial was there was a mixed uh, cohort of patients that included active progressive and chronic progressive MS patients. And when you looked at one of the outcome measures, which was change in brain parenchymal fraction, as measured by MRI over time, the ibutilast cohort uh, had less atrophy than the placebo cohort. And these results were most robust in individuals who had chronic progressive disease. And so trials are being designed to understand if ibutilast truly can change the progressive course of the disease without uh, altering the immune-mediated, adaptive immune-mediated portion of relapsing remitting or active secondary progressive MS. Furthermore, an interesting intervention is currently ongoing, uh, an extension of its phase one study, uh, which is known as ATA-188. So this is a EBV-targeted T-cell immunotherapy. 
So it basically takes HLA matched T cells that target the EBV antigen on the surface of other T cells. And the thought is that if we infuse an MS patient with these cells, they will go and clear out the EBV activated T lymphocytes within a patient. And if indeed these EBV activated T lymphocytes are driving MS in terms of progression, then we would expect for there to be a clinical efficacy signal from this therapy. Phase one dose finding studies have been underway uh, with different results reported over time, and this remains an active area of research to determine if we could clear these immune cells, would patients benefit? So there are a variety of drugs being studied, including randomized trials of simvastatin, which I don't have time to go into detail today, but a variety of drugs with different mechanisms of actions that look to expand our arsenal for progressive disease. But as I talked about the blurring of margins between the spectrum of biologies and the spectrum of therapies, it's important to shift gears and talk about neuroprotection strategies because these would play an integral role in treating not just relapsing remitting patients, but also patients uh, who are suffering from progressive disease. So this diagram, uh, which illustrates a variety of different potential drug targets relative to neuroprotection, give us an outline of where therapies are emerging. There are ways to induce neuroprotection via uh, certain microglial cell populations. There are ways to protect uh, oligodendrocytes and myelin formation. And there are ways to protect neurons via modulation of acetylcholine receptors or NMDAR receptors. Furthermore, the changing of sodium or calcium influx or efflux out of a neuron can change ATP formation and mitochondrial health. Such there are a variety of ways to induce neuroprotection in a dish or in an animal. And for each of these strategies, there are studies being done to translate them to humans. But in addition to neuroprotection, there are strategies meant to induce remyelination. And on this diagram are the list of potential receptors and drug targets that can induce myelin formation within a damaged nervous system. Many of these drugs have undergone clinical trials and are going through further development. And so this gives you a sense of the spectrum of different targets, but I wanna nail down specifically what's actually in clinical trials. We don't have time to cover all of them today, but this is a table of ongoing phase one, phase two, phase three trials of different agents that are meant to induce neuroprotection or remyelination. And you can see a diversity of drugs. And when compared to the slides outlining biology before, there's a diversity of mechanisms of, uh, mechanisms of action that are being studied amongst these drugs. And so without the ability to talk about all of these, I thought it would be worthwhile to highlight just a couple. So one that's gonna be highlighted is the op uh, opacinumab trials, uh, which has undergone the RENEW trial and the SYNERGY trial. Uh, these were both randomized placebo-controlled trials. One was a phase two trial uh, looking at patients with acute optic neuritis. In the SYNERGY trial, it was looking at multiple sclerosis in general. And while these trials did not meet the primary endpoint over the total population, very uh, useful data around trial design, uh, dosing, and patients uh, who may be most able to benefit led to the design and launch of the AFFINITY trial, which is a randomized placebo-controlled phase two trial in multiple sclerosis. This is an ongoing trial using this monoclonal antibody, uh, which is an anti-lingo antibody, and is meant to induce oligoprogenitor cells to remyelinate a damaged nervous system. This has been something both clinicians and patients have been looking for for years, and uh, we remain hopeful uh, that we will find a, a signal of efficacy and have something new to offer our patients. Furthermore, in the setting of neuroprotection and remyelination is um, a molecule known as the CNM AU8 molecule. These are gold nanocrystals. And uh, this always prompts some interesting conversations with patients when we tell them we wanna study the use of gold to treat their multiple sclerosis. Uh, 
So what's interesting is gold has been looked at for years uh, as a possible therapy because of its ability to change the energetics of a cell and change the mitochondrial function of a cell, particularly within neurons and oligoprogenitor cells. The issue has been getting a formulation of gold at a molecular level that is both uh, able to get into cells within the brain and uh, operate in an efficient uh, fashion biochemically. And these gold nanocrystals known as CNMAU8 are currently under study in two trials, Visionary MS and Repair MS. Um, in full disclosure, we are uh, involved in this research at UT Southwestern. The trials are ongoing. And while preliminary data has been uh, discussed at national meetings, there have not yet been any peer reviewed publications relative to the data. But we remain hopeful that this drug may offer options both for neuroprotection and or remyelination to patients with multiple sclerosis. So we've talked about therapies that immunomodulate, we've talked about therapies that uh, immune remodel, immunosuppress, and we've moved on to neuroprotection and remyelination. But those aren't the only therapies in development relative to multiple sclerosis. For our patients who have had damage to the central nervous system, if we can't repair it, we have to consider symptomatic management. And it's worth knowing that there are a variety of drugs available uh, to treat symptoms. Most of them are off-label. Uh, it has been rare for us to get drugs specifically FDA approved to treat a specific issue relative to the sequelae of multiple sclerosis. But there are multiple under study, under study right now. Uh, I don't have time to discuss all of these, but we'll focus on an old drug uh, that's being used in a new formulation, uh, ER amantadine. Uh, also known as ADS5102. So shown here was the results of a phase two clinical trial that looked at walking speed uh, as a primary outcome uh, and walking distance during the two minute walk test. And compared to placebo, uh, patients with this drug uh, had a statistically significant improvement in their walking. There is currently a phase three trial underway. Uh, the outcomes include uh, tracking um, adverse events, as well as 25-foot walk time. It's important to note that this is an open-label trial, not a placebo-controlled trial, uh, but nonetheless, we uh, await its results to determine whether or not we'll have a new option for treating symptoms of multiple sclerosis. Commonly in my clinic, besides discussing emerging therapies around um, uh, immunomodulation, neuroprotection, remyelination, and beyond discussing symptomatic therapy, I get asked the question about complementary and alternative therapies on a regular basis. And uh, depending on what state you're in, there are large discussions going on about cannabis-based therapies relative to the symptomatic treatment of MS, uh, or uh, for some folks, discussion of whether or not it would have a role in modulating the disease, for which there isn't much data, but the discussions keep going. There are a variety of therapies that have been or are being studied uh, relative to multiple sclerosis uh, that are considered uh, nutritional-based, vitamin-based uh, agents. Unfortunately, the results of the large-scale placebo-controlled phase three biotin trial uh, recently released this year had a negative result. Uh, there was not an ability to see a change in progression of the disease. This was a disappointment to all of us after the promising results out of Europe. Uh, but despite this uh, funded research in active complementary therapies, uh, including nutritional supplements, uh, continue to go on. Uh, specifically, I'll highlight ongoing research relative to alpha-lipoic acid. So in results uh, that came out a few years ago from a phase two placebo-controlled trial, what was found when measuring brain volume over time was a statistically significant uh, protection of brain, a reduction in atrophy rate for individuals who were taking alpha-lipoic acid as compared to placebo. Uh, this was an exciting result uh, to see a nutritional supplement uh, in a well-designed, well-executed trial lead to a statistically significant outcome. And phase three trials are moving forward to determine whether or not there's a role for alpha-lipoic acid in the treatment of multiple sclerosis patients, whether they be relapsing remitting or progressive. Inevitably, in my clinic, when we talk about uh, complementary or alternative therapies, I get a question. Dr. Greenberg, what about stem cells? And before I can even answer that question, uh, a lot of patients will say, 
I want to go to Panama and get stem cells. And uh, for a lot of us in the trenches, we feel ill-equipped to have conversations with our patients about where we are relative to stem cell development and multiple sclerosis and what to do about clinics that are popping up around the country uh, and around the world. And so what I'd like to do is give everybody a brief primer on the emerging world of stem cell therapies, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, and what you should consider when talking with patients. So first, when talking about unmet needs within multiple sclerosis, I think it's fair to say uh, that we have not yet proven the value of stem cell therapies to our patient population. And part of the issue with uh, navigating the literature has to do with the nomenclature. Um, because the use of the term stem cell is used broadly, but there are a variety of different stem cells uh, that we may be talking about. For example, we discussed bone marrow transplants, which are categorized as a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Now, the thought behind these stem cell transplants is not that those autologous bone marrow cells are entering the brain and repairing damage, but it's meant to remodel the immune system and prevent new damage. So even though we use the term stem cell, it's not in the normal fashion that most patients think about a stem cell. Most patients think about human embryonic derived stem cells or adult derived mesenchymal stem cells, where these cells are differentiated either into neuronal precursor cells or more commonly oligoprogenitor cells and introduced back into the human being with a hope of repair. Now, it's important to note that there are ongoing trials within the United States of different versions of stem cells, not just to induce repair, but to explore them from a immunomodulation perspective. It turns out that the introduction of certain stem cells into the bodies of individuals with autoimmune disease may lead to a reduction in inflammation within the central nervous system. But this is not without risk. And it is extremely important for us to study this therapy just like we would any other drug therapy under rigorous clinical trials. Uh, for patients who are suffering from multiple sclerosis, who are suffering from disability, uh, there is an understandable desire to try anything that might help. And it is in this environment where uh, our patients have uh, been tempted uh, and in fact have gone overseas uh, to try unproven or even risky therapies. Uh, the group I hear about the most is the one out of Panama, and I thought it'd be useful for um, the community to understand what's being advertised to our patients. So uh, there, the clinic in Panama City uh, advertises uh, that uh, under the title, Can Stem Cells Help Treat MS? While they say that there are no FDA-approved treatments that specifically target the abnormal responses in MS. Uh, I'm not sure that's true. We, we have a lot of therapies that target uh, the immune system in a mess. And they go on to say that all of our approaches are nonspecific, um, but that mesenchymal stem cells uh, could be helpful. Uh, this is a leap to say the least that mesenchymal stem cells would be specific in multiple sclerosis or the autoimmune attack against myelin. And yet this is what our patients read uh, when they go to the websites of these clinics. It's important to note that this clinic in Panama uh, used to be in Costa Rica until the Costa Rican government shut them down. Um, the director of the clinic moved uh, from Costa Rica to Panama and opened the Stem Cell Institute. <clears throat> this is a very professional looking uh, website. You have to apply uh, to be accepted as a patient. And in order to apply, you have to read the following disclaimer and click the yes button at the bottom of the page. And in, uh, transparently, the disclaimer says the, the science uh, of adult stem cells is in its infancy, uh, that these uh, uh, therapies have not been evaluated by the FDA, and that they are not standard of care, that there are unknown risks, uh, there have been no randomized controlled trials, um, that uh, a patient needs to understand that the treatments will be done after you sign consent, and that the testimonials, the videos that plague YouTube of people who have been cured by these therapies, and, and I have no doubt that they are better and I'm not calling their testimonials into question, um, are not, uh, the website says these are not typical uh, or not necessarily typical. Uh, and then uh, they note that you will be responsible 
for fees. They go on to say that the starting fees for these are 23,000 for adults. From what I understand, the average cost ends up being between 30 and 50,000. Uh, but do know that you will get um, uh, VIP customs uh, clearance, a stay at the Hilton breakfast and Wi-Fi. So uh, a little uh, eggs and Wi-Fi with your stem cell therapy in Panama City. When talking about this with patients who understandably want to try anything, it's important to remind them that these unregulated uh, clinics that have popped up around the country using an, uh, a science that is not completely understood with protocols that have not been vetted do not come risk-free. Even though uh, the agents that we use today that are FDA approved have risk, we've quantified that risk through careful study. There are no follow-ups happening with these patients who are going to stem cell clinics around the world in any meaningful way. And so it is only by case reports do we start to collect data relative to potential outcomes. And uh, as an example, what we see are individuals like this gentleman who didn't have multiple sclerosis. Uh, he had had a stroke, but uh, did what is referred to as international stem cell tourism. And unfortunately over years developed a mass in his spinal cord, uh, leading to paralysis. And when the mass was removed, what they found was it was stem cells, somebody else's DNA, uh, growing in this gentleman, leading to this clinically significant tumor. There have been deaths, blindness, a variety of adverse events uh, happening with individuals who undergo stem cell tourism, and we need to make our patients aware. We also need to own the fact that our current therapies do come with risk, but the difference is we can quantify that we understand it through regulated trials, and we're not hiding the risk. We are actively looking for adverse events and reporting them in a structured way. In the unregulated world of stem cell tourism, there aren't the same precautions or safety measures that allow us to have confidence in these protocols. That said, the currently uh, studied stem cells undergoing rigorous uh, studies under FDA guidance uh, carry significant hope for us sorting out how to safely use these therapies to benefit our patients. So that's a lot of information uh, I'd like to summarize with conclusions about what we've talked about. So the first is after a massive decade of explosion in uh, therapies, uh, we still have needs. And thankfully for the next 10 years, we still have hope of new therapies coming out with novel mechanisms of action. And that becomes critical because of the spectrum of disease and the spectrum of biology that's at play within our patient population. So we need a spectrum of therapies, not just additional therapies in the same class, in order to offer our patients a variety of interventions to halt relapses, halt progression, induce neuroprotection and repair. There are a variety of options um, for our patients with both relapse remitting and primary progressive MS. Uh, the field is no longer solely focused on relapse remitting, but has had intense focus on individuals who are having progressive disease. And we are getting to a place where neuroprotection and repair will be a reality. There are well-designed and well-executed trials that have happened and that are underway. And it is from these trials that we'll be able to sort out which of our patient populations might best benefit from which drugs from a protection and repair perspective. And finally, it's worth noting that even though there's a lot of hope and a lot of promise relative to emerging therapies and multiple sclerosis, there are challenges. With success, specifically the number of different therapies we have that work for our patients, the pool of patients with uncontrolled MS continues to decline, which makes recruiting for trials more difficult. In a way, this is a good problem to have, which means we're being successful, in terms of meeting the needs of our patients, but it will make it more challenging to conduct appropriately designed and executed uh, clinical, controlled clinical trials. As such, we are gonna need as a field to get more organized and more creative in terms of how we study novel and emerging therapies across the spectrum of our disease. With that, I wanna thank you for your time and your attention uh, from wherever you are uh, taking part in this. And as I said at the beginning, my thanks to the CMSC uh, and all of its partners for allowing us to move what has always been a remarkable meeting face-to-face -to, -face to be a meeting virtually. I look forward to seeing everybody uh, hopefully in person next year. Thank you.